Well, welcome to episode four of the Rugby League United podcast, the sport's biggest names, discussing their life uh, aspects of their career, aspects too of their uh, mental fitness. We're going to focus a bit today on adversity, building resilience uh, when we go through tough times, which unfortunately we all have to do in life, and a, bit, a little bit on perception as well. In the company of uh, one of the best wingers in the game, England's all-time top try scorer, uh, currently going to say living it up in Australia, but reclining <laughs> in Australia as it looks. Ryan Hall, how are you, first of all? Uh, I'm very good, uh, given the circumstances. Um, lot, uh, there's a lot uh, to look up, you know, look forward to yeah. uh, over this side of sports, you know, kind of gathering, uh, gathering more momentum than it is doing in England over in Australia. So there's quite a lot to look forward to. It's, um, yeah, I imagine it's a bit of a different place, um, a bit of a different experience, what I'm experiencing to what a lot of people are doing in England. Because uh, the numbers, obviously, surrounding the you know the whole pandemic thing, it's a uh, very different. Uh, England's got really really high numbers, and yeah. Australia's just got low numbers, and it's you know really, really well you know monitored and you know, looked after. So hopefully it stays that way. Uh, that's why uh, things are relaxing quite well over here. Yeah, do you think it would be different for you if you if you were back here? I mean, I'm speaking to you from Manchester, and you're in Sydney. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I've, obviously I keep, I'm keeping tabs quite a lot on, on England. I've got family and friends over there to see how it's going on, and um, like uh, look at all the news and what's going on and stuff. And it's it's quite po- you know it's quite po- polarizing. Um, they're trying to really you know slowly relax the you know the lockdown over here, and they've been really cautious about it. And I think England's uh, going along at the same pace as well, which I can't quite understand because the numbers are very very different between the two countries, but. I'm not a politician. I'm not a world leader or any um, you know, health yet. expert. So I'll let, yeah, not yet. So I'll let uh, the experts, you know, you know, sort that out. Just uh, what I find here, days of lockdown, whether they're hard or, or or easy, a lot dependent on the weather. I'm looking out today. The sun's actually out in Manchester, so I know today's going to be all right. But what's it like over there? Um, well, it was, when did we start? Was it March? Mm. Um, so the back end of summer. We had the back end of summer. Um, and it's just gone into winter now, so it's actually started being a bit colder. Um, but in the early, early stages, in the sun, uh, it was pretty good because we've got a balcony and we've got um, the sun like pretty much all day on this balcony. So that was yeah, it was no problem. Uh, has this has this period, this strange period, been a good thing for you in a way? You've, we're going to talk about adversity and resilience, and I mean, your career was just kind of perfect until a, a couple of years ago, and then you've been dealt. A lot of tough stuff to deal with in a in quite a short space of time, which we'll come into. But has this, in a strange way, given you that that chance to to get back back up to speed in terms of fitness? Um, yeah, it's um, it's hard to say uh, because there's that you know so much disappointment going on in the world at the moment. But it's been been a blessing for me. Um, like you say, we'll get onto it in a, in a bit. But um, like. It was coming out of the back end of pre-season because of my injuries or whatever. I couldn't actually get the work done that I needed to do, you know, fitness-wise. Mm. So when the game started playing again, I reckon when, when my knee was good to go, but the rest of my body wasn't. Um, so that the time off where, you know, everyone kind of reset again, I just powered through and, you know, we had, um, I got all my fitness equipment uh, delivered home so I could just smash the fitness best I could every day. It's not the same as doing, you know, rugby training on the field, but... Um, I was catching up, you know, every day that was going by, I was catching back up to the lads who had, you know, got to a good level of fitness. So now we're back in, I'm, put, I'm you know, training full time. That's good. So it's almost like this has allowed you to, to hit the pause button on everyone else's fitness. It's like, right, when we take pause off, I'm going to be, I'm going to be back up to your level because your fight isn't, yeah. only, isn't only fitness, is it? It's, it's getting, getting into that, getting into that squad, which you, you've fallen away from because of what's happened. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's um, a different. I'm playing a different game to what you know what I've done the majority of my career. Um, I, you know, I fully understand um, you know, where I'm at and um, the, the injuries I've been dealt. It's kind of pushed me out of the out of the team, uh, which is rightly so. Um, and the team that I'm playing at the moment has been you know very successful. And the, mm. the players that are playing in my position, that you know they finished the season brilliantly. So I've got, I've got no, not got no worries about you know me not playing because you know I'm there to facilitate a team, and if the team's doing well, you know without me, uh, there's not much I can do yeah. uh, apart from prepare the best and just be ready for whenever the, uh, whenever the, t- uh, the team needs me. So uh, yeah, there's a bit of realism there. Does that 
I don't know how you are with, with self-doubt. On a, on a previous episode, we spoke with uh, Reese Lynn at England and Wakefield, and he said he's always, he's always been ha- had a real problem with fear and anxiety and self-doubt, because even when he got the call from Wayne Bennett saying he was in the England squad, he didn't believe it. He's like, I'm not good enough to play yeah. for England. I mean, does that, looking at those players, that you've got to fight back from injury and try and get past, does, does, does that make you doubt yourself, or are you just kind of, oh, this is, this is how it is? <laughs> I reckon if I was, um, how many years younger, shall I say? 13 years younger. If I was 13 years younger, yeah. that might, might, might come into it. But because I've been around for a long time now, like you say, I've, I've played for England for 40, 40 times. Yeah. I've got 40 caps. I'm well experienced. And I know uh, the journey of a rugby league player. Um, I didn't have, a, have to experience it, you know, firsthand. Um, because I was pretty much like I've selected, you know, the majority of the time at Leeds. But I've been around players who have been in the position that I am now. Yeah. Um, so I didn't just because I didn't experience that first time. You know, they're not playing. Uh, doesn't mean I don't know. You know what to do because um, even in my first year, it was in 2007. Uh, the team got to a grand final. I was 18th man. Right. You know, I was you know playing the younger. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I was sat on the sideline in the blue shirt. And uh, last year, um, the team got to a grand final, which we won, and I was 18th man again in that day. It's just, it's um, so I'm. Uh, I've been around rugby league, you know, quite a while now, so I know what how to conduct myself and so did, you, did you deal with that Sydney one better? I don't want to dwell too much on Leeds because you know, I, me and Danny Maguire wax lyrical for our know, <laughs> yeah. episode. I don't, I don't want to bore non-Leeds fans throughout the whole series of this. But did you deal with the Sydney one better than the first one because of your experience? Um, yeah, I, I just think because I was, in a, you know, I'm a bit more mature. Um, right. You know, but it was the first real injury um, I got. Uh, it was it was not funny at all, but it's funny how it happened. Um, it was a big decision for me to leave. You know, Leeds, a successful club, and yeah. you know, I've been there for that long. Everyone just expected me to be a Leeds, you know, stayer and play it all the way through. But um, yeah, the time was running out, so there was a bit of thinking to do. And when it actually, you know, assigned for the Roosters, um, I thought, you know, big emotional change. And all that sort of stuff. Then three weeks later, uh, still playing the season at Leeds, uh, did my ACL. <laughs> you know, the, probably yeah. the worst thing you can do to your knee. Uh, and it's the first operation I've had so uh, that I, um, you know I had playing rugby. Um, so I've played all them games and all them years at Leeds, pretty much unscathed. Uh, as soon as I decided to you know, have a big change, it was literally three weeks after I signed on the dotted line uh, that I did I my ACL. I remember. Um, so that, that yeah, that was odd. Um, so I didn't I, I, I didn't know any other way to deal with it apart from just one foot in front of the other. Just keep going. Um, I've seen other people uh, have the operation, you know, do, do the injury, then have their operation come out fighting on the other side. Um, and the, the, when I was uh, I spoke to the coaches and all the staff at the Roosters saying, "Oh, I've, I've done my ACL," they 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 put me at ease straight away. They right. said. Um, don't worry, this pretty much said, don't worry about it, we'll get you through it. Um, they've had a couple of their players go through the ACL uh, repair um, and they've come out, you know, still playing and they're still international quality players. So don't worry about it, we'll get you right. So that straight, that phone call that I had straight away put me at ease um, and I didn't really have to battle much. I just had to get on with it and just do the rehab. Yeah, I was going to come on to later that, that period and of that hugely unsettling period of leaving Leeds and all the injuries. But, I mean, you've got into it so nicely now. We might, might as well discuss it a bit more now. A, a bit more about what that period that, what that period was like. It must have been... It's such a hugely unsettling thing anyway. It's not like you're signing for Sol. You're, you're, with no disrespect to Sol, you're, you know, you're, you're making a massive decision to relocate your family. And then, bang, you must think everything's gone up in smoke when, when your knee snaps like that. Uh, yeah, it was... Um... It was a weird weekend because I, I did it on the Friday. Uh, all the all the physios knew, but they wouldn't verbalise it because until you get the scan results, they did the hands-on test, you know, when they test the leg, right. but they didn't want to say to me when they were testing it, you've done the ACL. Uh, they just said, "Oh, don't look good, but we'll wait for the scan, you know, uh, results to uh, come back." So they all knew that were going on. And at home, when I was sat uh, waiting, you know, for the results to come through, um, bit of a strange period because a million things going on in my head uh, about what we decided to do. You know all the family sort of things, but like like I say, um, it was all sorted out within an hour. As soon as I got the results, I got straight on the phone saying, "Look, 
this is a diagnosis. Um, it, I, it was literally sorted out. My, my mind was, you know, put at ease. Um, all the, like you say, um, the upheaval of a family. But that was actually, um, I wouldn't say that was a negative uh, decision for me. Uh, it wasn't one of those, you know, where I was a bit like, oh, it's a bit risky. Mm. I was moving my family from, from Leeds, from rainy Leeds, <laughs> to li- living on a beach in Sydney. Yeah. And that was only, it was always going to be a positive change. It was never going to be a negative change. Um, so I was like, I couldn't wait. <laughs> I was just like, uh, for the lifestyle thing of doing the best for my family, I couldn't wait to, you know, get over here. And it's been, you know, from the uh, lifestyle side of things, living in Sydney, it's great. I mean, how good is it? Uh, I go pick my kid up, kids up from school and then carry on in the car for five minutes and I get to the beach and just play cricket on the beach. <laughs> you can't, can't do that in Leeds. You, you know, you can't put, um, yeah, you can't value. You can't put a valuation on that. You know? so, yeah, but it's so that side. That side of things, it's it was an easy decision. You say that, but it is. I mean, on the face of it, absolutely right. What kind of decision is that? But it, it is still stressful. If it, if it was if it was that straightforward a thing for us to do in our life, we'd all yeah. we'd all do it, wouldn't we? It's just easy um, just to carry on in our life and not get out of our comfort zone. Something must have happened to make you think, right? Let's get out of the comfort zone for a bit. Um, probably the. Uh, what do you call it? Groundhog Day, maybe. Right. Well, but you know, I'd, I'd done it for eleven years. I've, you know, yeah, I, I've I've won the championships at Leeds. I've you know I've played the thirty-five game seasons before. I've done it. Um, I've done it a few times. I've been successful doing it as well. I mean, it's great having success, but uh, there is um, there's a bit, a bit of a balance, you know, like a tipping scale. Yeah. It's like, what do you want to success or you know a new challenge? And I thought of. You know, I don't know how much more I was going to achieve by doing the same thing. Um, so it was uh, my first decision to go. It was just a bit of a. Um, I just went to go see. Sorry, my daughter's just walked in. She wants something. That's all right. She's, <laughs> oh, she's, she's been, been asleep out of the room she again. I know oh, she's been asleep out of the room. She's gone. <laughs> um, so what I was saying about the tipping scale thing. Um, yeah, it was about the, the new challenge and. When I wanted to move, it wasn't just um, right. I want to go and do this. It was just, it was just a curious curiosity to okay. see if any clubs in the NRL would want to take me on. Being at the age I was, you know, and all that sort of things. And a few clubs came back, um, and the Roosters were one of them. It was one of those moments where it was like a golden opportunity. You know, got placed in front of me. I would have been mad not to take it because you know the prestigious club and um, the very well. Well, well run, they're well coached, and it was you know to carry on a learning curve. Uh, it was a great step for me to do. But why did that? Why do you think that light bulb moment didn't happen earlier? Because you didn't need that that final season at least to win something else. Because you'd already won everything. So, and you would, yeah. I'm sure you would have had offers from like Sydney stuff earlier on in your career. You probably did. I don't know, but th- that opportunity must have presented itself before, and you d- you didn't make that decision. It's as simple as um, it's the first time. In the 11 years at Leeds, I was out of contract. Right. Every other year um, with my contract, it was always, you know, let's say I started a three-year one to start with, and then I played well during that three-year one. And then we added two more years on, and then another two more years on. And then I never got to within the final two years of the contract. It kept on being extended and extended and extended um, until like the final one finally got there, and it got within 12 months. And it was the first opportunity, um, you know, to explore other clubs I've been um, it always seems to happen after the um, international series because I played you know, quite a few years international um, I got quite a few inquiries just one off phone calls from clubs or people that you know representing the club just saying oh what are your contracts what's your contract status and I tell them oh I've got three years left on this contract and they went ah okay well rings in three years and then it, you know and that was pretty much the end of that it never really got further than that so I had the interest in, as in you know, a phone call's worth, but because of my contract status, it was never going to develop why, into anything else. That's why Gary Hetherington's a good good at his job, isn't it? He made sure you're yeah, on contract all the time. Under, under, yeah, hundred percent. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he's a smart man, Gary. Um, yeah, he's done it before. So that so that period. Um, let, let, let's just feature a little bit more on that. That 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 light bulb moment. You made the decision. Okay, you've 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 processed the injury. By the by, the sounds of that, you've you've processed that quite quickly and quite well. Kind of fight or flight, you Ryan all sprung into action. I said, well, right, what can I do? You're very logical. Did you take the yeah, out and yeah. be logical? 
Uh, I just I saw it as a as a challenge. Oh, oh, everyone always sees it as a challenge, but I broke it down into mini challenges. So when I did it before my operation, I was uh, sat in the change room at Leeds, opposite Liam Sutcliffe, who'd gone through the process yeah. himself. Um, I was just asking, obviously, the questions you're asking, you know, is how long did it take you to come back playing? What happened? And you know, and all that sort of thing. And he said to me, "Oh, um, operation went great." Um, I walked out the day after the operation, no crutches and no brace on my knee. And I thought, because that was the first I heard of, you know, the immediate aftermath of an operation of what, what happens. Um, so I was like, oh, brilliant. So I, uh, in my head, I'm like, well, I'll just, the day after my operation, I walk out with no crutches, uh, with no brace on my knee and just get on with it. Um, uh, and then, <laughs> then the time came to leave hospital and they brought me a wheelchair and the pain was unbelievable. I didn't have any crutches. I basically told them, get that wheelchair off. I'm walking out of here just because someone else had done it. And I told myself, that's what I'm doing. Even though it's probably sensible to get, you know, in hindsight, it's probably sensible to get back in that wheelchair or after some crutches because it really, really hurt uh, walking out. But I made myself do it. And that was kind of the attitude I had for every stage of it. So like two days later, I was it. Um, I was in the physio room at Leeds asking, right, what is the first step that I need to achieve, you know, to progress this thing along? And it was basically just trying to achieve full extension in your knee. It wasn't to try and use any muscles or anything. It was just to make sure your leg can straighten. So I just sat trying to straighten my knee. And, um, and I was asking, like, well, how long is that normally, you know, in this sort of situation? And the physio just would never give me a straight answer. It would be like, well... Everyone's different. Some some takes a you know a week. Some have it really quickly. Some takes a month. I'm like, right, I'm going as fast as I can. Like as soon as I get that, you know, as soon as I get that, it's you know it's going to speed everything up, and then I can ask what next next part of the puzzle, you know, you know what's the next bit, and everything along uh, that way. I was always asking, how many days is this going to take for me to do this little tiny bit to move on to the next bit? And uh, um, it must have it must have been glad that I was moving clubs. Because he must, he would have got sick of me if he lasted me enough for nine months, uh, doing the same thing. Because it, uh, it was like two months that I was doing the physio at Leeds until I moved over here. Uh, so I, I reckon he was glad to see it back of me because <laughs> I was just asking him, you know, all the time, you know, what's the next bit? What's the next bit? Uh, but that's how I attacked it, and that's how I thought, you know, that you know, if we're going to come back quickly and you know, the best I can, I just need to do it as fast as I could. That's really interesting. That that kind of breaking down what feels like a kind of insurmountable challenge breaking it down into little things and it actually becomes manageable and the only thing I can kind of compare that to is if if and when I run a marathon and you know that's quite a horrible thought when you say I'm doing it I always I always break it down into kind of I forget I forget the miles after 20 because I know that you, that's just your body taking over because it's so hard so I think right I've got 20 yeah. miles I've got five little four mile bits so I take it right I'm yeah. gonna run four miles and you get to that and then you reassess don't you and you set yourself yeah. those little targets as you go in and it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. All, it's almost like we're playing tricks tricks on our head a little bit, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, 100%, yeah. It's uh, even down to, you know, when we have to do a conditioning session, we used to go to Roundy Park in the hills, and it's mad, like, everyone's got, because you know it's going to be hard work, it's mad thinking, you know, speaking to other players and their, what goes through their head when it, um, you know, when they're doing hills. So if you've got told you've got 10 hills to do, like, you stand at bottom, instead of just thinking, right, run up 10, 10 times, you break it down into... In like smaller bits, manageable chunks. So there's people sat at the bo uh, bottom thinking, right, I've got three sets of three to do, accomplish. Then I've just got one more after that. It's like, what are you on about? Yeah. Like, just run up ten to <laughs> like, like, but but the breaking it down, it just helps you get through it. Because like once you achieve that little block, you somehow you, you get energy repaired back, and it's yeah, it's um, it's so right. it's something that everyone does, and it, it helps. It does work. So take me. So we 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 got to Australia, which must have felt really weird. Uh, when, when you got there for the first time, are you are you, you able to walk okay by the time you walk into the house? Oh yeah, um, I, I got walking pretty, you know, pretty. It was all, you know, it was all right. It was only painful for a bit, um, but then uh, it was everything else. Um, <laughs> and then I, I speak to other people from other clubs. Like um, it was a bit later on down the line, so it was when we played Wigan. Um, I was, you know. Uh, in the World Club Challenge. Uh, so I was at you know, Roosters training for quite a few months. It was February. So I'd gone back over and then I saw Joe Burgess and uh, Don Manfredi in, in the tunnel before the, you know, the players came out. And both of them were going through the same thing. And uh, I was saying, I'm getting pain in the front of my knee. And they both like, looked at it and they started laughing because it's exactly the same for every ACL thing. It's the, that's the thing, what's the hardest thing to get over. And that's what I was struggling. It was felt like I'd plateaued for a bit on that, you know, just the pain in the front of my knee. 
and they were just saying, yeah, that's not just get on with it. And then at that point where they start, right, um, it's never going to be perfect. I'm going to have pain in my front and my knee. That's fine. Uh, just I've got to figure out how to play with pain in my knee. Uh, but it was structurally fine. I was having, having scans on it, and it like it was healed. Everything was you know strong. And they couldn't you know when the physios were trying to twist it and you know see if it was going to go. It would not budging. So I knew it, I knew it was it was strong. So I just had to cope with the you know pain. Just put that to one side and get on with it. And you finally got the Sydney shirt. Oh, was it May? I think, and there must have been. <laughs> might be yeah, might have been. But it's about that time, wasn't it? And and I'm sure, and I, and I remember as a as a young rugby supporter in Leeds when Leeds used to sign all these overseas players from the NRL and there was you know the thing was oh, have we signed another croc you know because it, it was a guy who'd come over you know and he you know I'm thinking of kind of the Brett Mullins era of player they'd come over and they'd be great for a bit and then they'd get injured and I guess, I'd imagine there must have been something similar going on with the crowd over there I don't know but anyway you, you got you got in the team and you got I think six games and then yeah a dislocation then was it? Yeah, uh, so I got back playing and um, I got back playing pretty well as well. I think uh, the team, I was going into the team and the team was realising, you know, what I did, what, what my style was and, you know, what I could bring to the team. I, I felt like we complemented each other. Um, and like it, my best game was the last game of them of them six games, you know, so I was getting better at each week. And then it was just a, an accident in training. Um uh, in a wrestle wrestle session, um, it, it was my other side, uh, <laughs> my other knee, my strong knee, let's call it. Yeah. Uh, d- uh, my kneecap dislocated. It was what it was what uh, Joe Westerman did on the field, and these pops, uh, he had to whack his back, back in. in. Yeah, yeah, but my, mine bounced in itself, but um, mine, mine must have been different to Joe's because immediately after it went, I had ele- elephantitis in my knee, I, like it just filled up with fluid, um, and I couldn't bend it. Um, I don't know what happened to Joe's after that. I think he played on, but I, I don't, he must not have swelled up like, like mine did. But, um, yeah, there was, there was no moving mine. Um, so I got it. Um, I kept on having it drained by the doctors. Um, and again, another little competition thing. I like, so, so how much fluid do you know is good, reckon is going to be in this knee? And they said, oh, a big, a big extraction is about 100 mil. And the first within the first day or two um, it's just blood you know because it just bleeds inside so it's just blood that they extract um, so like uh, a, one of the biggest of scenes about 100 millilitres of, uh, of blood that they pull out um, they were still pulling out at 130 140 and it got to 150 mil in my, in my knee uh, so another little record I, you know achieved the most swelling knee that, that they've seen um, and it seemed to it, every time they drained it it just kept on swelling back up again um, that was the sticking point like um, but the kneecap was in place and all that sort of stuff all ligaments are strong but it just kept on filling up with fluid so it just kept on jamming and I couldn't do anything on it I'm struck by how you, you take all these setbacks in your stride I mean, you're laughing as you're telling yeah. me and you, you know talking through the challenges but I know to a lot of people this this could drive them into quite a, quite a dark place you, you, you know you've made, a, you've made a massive move here and you, it must have been part of your thought this is turning into an absolute disaster Oh, there's not a day that I think what's going on here. Like, <laughs> I even have a joke again. I'm laughing again, but um, it was a th- like it was a three weeks bit uh, after I signed. Uh, made me think about uh, there was there must have been something about Leeds where it just kept me in the magical bubble of injury freeness. Uh, I reckon it was Gary Evanson. I reckon he's got a voodoo doll of me. As soon as I signed away from his club, he slashed it. He started slashing at it. <laughs> I feel like me, uh, both my knees have gone. Um, but yeah. Uh, it's just uh, one of those things, you know. I've been, you know, really blessed with injuries throughout my career, and they just happened all at once. But touch wood, that's it now. Hopefully, you know, that's it. Does it, does that make your your mental approach different now? When if and when we get the NRL back, which is going to be very soon, I know you're you're fit and you're available. Do you approach it differently when you've had these injuries? Is it does it play on your mind? Whereas before, when you're injury free, you just have gone full pelt, and it wouldn't have it wouldn't have even entered your head that. You've got two dodgy knees. Yeah. Um, if if you go to a field thinking about an injury, you're never going to be as, as good as what you need to be. If you go and thinking, oh, I'm carrying a bit of a knock in my knee, I'm going to grow a little bit softer. You're never going to achieve what you're going to achieve. So, I'd, as soon as you as soon as you get warm, you know, and everything frees up a bit, I, I don't think about them because it, 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 if my knee's not strong enough, it, yeah, it'll it'll give in and it'll it'll go again. But I need to 
it needs to be strong for me to do what I need to do. So I've just got to trust in it being strong. Um, yeah. <laughs> if it, yeah. If you yeah. think you're going to get injured or you're going to re yeah, aggravate an injury, you're more than likely they are going to do that. You, you know, for, for a moment there, I thought you were just about to say, if you want the rainbow, you've got to put up with the rain. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I'd leave that for Dolly Parton. <laughs> uh, you've, you've talked a lot I, don't, I want to talk in a second about, about perception and who Ryan Hall is and the perception of Ryan Hall we're not getting without trying to get too deep but you've talked a lot I'm struck by how you talk about you learn about yourself by talking to others you learn about your challenges by talking to others who've gone through the same thing how close are you with all the other English guys out there I mean we just you just quoted a line from the office and I know James Graham's out there and he, yeah. he, he loves all that are you Are you? do you kind of stick have you got a stick together mentality over there you... um, we, we kind of like it as in, um, in you know the English the right. sector doing well in the other way and we love it um, the, the guys at Canberra you know John Bateman went over last year because mm. he, he was fresh in the NRL and he killed it it was great all the lads you know, loved it an English guy doing like one of his mates doing well in the NRL um We've got, you know, obviously we've got a WhatsApp group where we chat and, you know, see if everyone's all right. But uh, in terms of meeting up, especially at the current climate, you know, we can't really meet up. And uh, Australia's pretty big <laughs> for, for us to meet up, for, for me to meet up with Canberra lads. I'd have to travel three hours. Uh, yeah, so and we've all got us little bits going on, like every now and then. Uh, if we might have an opportunity to, to meet up, but, you know, my daughter's got a dance recital to do or you know, anything like that. It's, you know, it, family gets in the way sometimes as well. But, um, yeah, when, you know, we all really, we, we met up in the England, England camp, you know, when we had the nice tournament and the GB. Uh, so it was good to see everyone there. So uh, let, me, let me talk a bit about perception. Um, what, what do you think the perception of, of you is from, from other people? What, what, uh, what, what, if, if I asked someone, what's Ryan all like, what do you think they would say? Uh, pretty dull. I, I reckon, well, I'm pretty much right as well. Uh, I remember doing a, um, a couple of years back at Leeds, doing like a, not a media course, but um, how to, you know, talk to cameras, bit of a, you know, to get better in front of a camera, basically. And uh, the guy who was running it was going along, you know, saying, oh, what do you want to get better at? And I straight away, I knew what I didn't like. And I didn't like how I sound because I sound monotone. Uh, I don't like how I sound, my voice sounds uh, when I speak into the camera. It's not about, you know, I don't mind what I say, that the, you know, the topics and the content that's what I say. It's the, the sound that comes along with it. It's just a monotone, deep drone, what people get bored at. Um, and the guy says, well, if that's your voice, but that's your voice, you can't change it. So I thought, oh, no. Okay, fair enough. And that's what I've just stuck with. He's got bar in one or two and they'll draw. <laughs> so you say that's what people are and it's probably right. Is, is it really though? Or is that just a persona that has just happened and you've kind of gone along with it? I don't, I don't know. It's just every time I go in front of the camera, it just the, the dullness, the, the same monotone comes out. Um, like I say, I, I've not got a problem with the content that I say. I can think of that with that up you know, quite well. But it's just... Um, yeah, the dullness comes from the sound. Even Rob Burrow used to do a, a great impression of me. He just used to go, <laughs> just like move his lift like that. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much how I sound. But uh, if that's what how people view me, that's fine. I'm, I'm really, really not bothered uh, what people think, to be honest. But I, if, used if to play, you... I used to play with um, blonde hair. Like, yeah, <laughs> I'm not bothered about what people think. And yeah, I think that's a good way to be as well. Uh, why, why should I worry about Someone, if someone else doesn't like something I do. No, I mean, I, I, I completely okay. agree. It goes back to, you know, character is what you are, reputation is what some others say you are. Yeah. But on the flip side of that, you say you're not bothered. You must have been bothered enough to ask that guy at the media training to try and make you better. Um, well, it was just all about improvement because I knew, like, at that point, you know, I had no idea what I was going to do post rugby and... Um, I thought, you know, a chance in the media or, you know, because a couple of players I've gone over and, you know, gone in front of the camera. Uh, Jamie Jones is brilliant at it. And I've always tried to learn stuff from him uh, because, you know, and I think, you know, he's just built for it. And some some people are built for it and some people aren't. And he's certainly, you know, got a future in that. So I tried to explore that a little bit. So I just thought that, you know, the only way I'm going to be able to get into it is by 
not being dull and monotone because you're not <laughs> you're not you're not going to be in front of a camera or any sort of presenter in you know with that sort of voice. Uh, so I just tried to you know see if there was something that I could you know I could do or you know something I I was doing wrong. You know I could think of it a different way, but uh, never mind. <laughs> yeah. do, do you feel like you, you're you're kind of different to a lot of the other rugby players. Certainly your path into the sport was different, wasn't it? It was an accounting degree and then suddenly you started playing rugby while you were yeah. doing it. Yeah, that's almost right. Because again, that, uh, I, yeah, that's my yeah. perception of you and maybe I've got it wrong. Yeah, uh, well, I didn't have an account, accounting degree. Um, I was always just, I was just good at maths at school. That was basically yeah. it. That's the fundamental, like the bottom line of it. I was just good at maths. So along with that comes, you know, people's perception of, oh, he's good at maths academically. He must be smart. So that was it. I was labelled a smart guy, even though I'm not actually particularly that smart. I've got no common sense. I was just good at numbers. <laughs> so I just, I just, you know, kept on going along with it. If people says, oh, you're all that smart guy, I just go, no, okay, I'm, yeah, I'm that guy. Um, and that's just how it was. And at the time, coming into the team, I was very much alone in that um, area of, you know, good at maths. Um, there wasn't many other people in the same sort of like, you know, type as me. Um, so then I was, again, I was a different, the odd one. So, so I wasn't going to start arguing with people and saying, no, I'm not different. It, you know, I just thought, yeah, whatever. I'm that guy. If you want to label me as that guy, that's fine. Um, and, that, and that's where, you know, it's what it's been all along. It's like whatever people want to think of me, I let them think, you know, and then I'm not going to try and change their opinion by explaining. No, I'm not actually that guy. I'm, you know, I just thought, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, um, I, I could but yeah. Uh, so I, how I got into rugby was I always I was, I was playing uh, amateur because I loved it. Um, I was a bit of a, I was a late developer, as you know, growing, you know, wise and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I kind of missed the fishing net that goes out, you know, the scouting fishing net uh, where people about 15 you know get signed up to scholarships and professional clubs I missed all that sort of thing and I was just playing because I love playing uh, down you know carried on uh, when I was 17 I played in the um, open age team at Alton and then uh, Leeds came down and watched me again and then because obviously I'd grown up and ca caught up a little bit then uh, then they signed me and that's how I got into the sport it was relatively late compared to everyone else but you know I was just just a different path in that um, I, I was struck by a lot of that because you're obviously aware of that the persona is something someone else has created for you, but it's just kind of easy to go, easy to go along with it. And I, I, I've I've had something very similar in my career. I'm kind of like you know the joke the jokey guy on the radio and telling you like you know he's a bit gobby and you know he's working class and he loves a pint and you know I'm actually a, you know just a shy shy bloke who has a French literature degree. And he's really bad at make and he's really bad at making friends. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I, yeah. Actually, that's me. But if you want to think that's me, that's quite, you know, that's that's an easy role for me to play. That's kind of what I did on the radar. Yeah, if you believe that, I'll go along with it. Yeah. But it's it's not an element of us where actually we should think no, no, no. That is this is me. And why why don't we? I like, I'm you know I'm battling with myself here. Why why don't we tell people yeah. who we really are? I don't know. Well, I know. Well, I'm not very confrontational. Right. So I don't want to start arguing with people. <laughs> so, you know, saying you've got me wrong. <laughs> you, yeah, it's fine. I don't need to go in an argument. I'll just get on. It's just an easy, easier route just to give them a thumbs up and say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but I know that you know that role of you know being the the maths geek. You know, I've seen I've seen videos that Leeds have got you doing like little you know Pythagoras stuff on a blackboard. And, so yeah. I can imagine you've been asked stuff to do that. And I know when you do an interview and someone chucks you a Rubik's Cube and says, can you do this? You must think, oh, not again. Come on. Yeah, well, um, they did it last year in the change rooms. So after one of the games on TV, um, they interviewed me in the change room and I had a Rubik's Cube in the pocket. And I just thought, I've done this a million times for a camera, but some people in Australia watching this might not have done it. So I, you, you do it like the first time you've done it before. So it's like, you know, so you just put that, Put that on a little bit because there's someone out there who probably hasn't seen you do it um so you know you've got to do it and that one person who hasn't seen you do it before might really get inspired by it or whatever you know if a rubik's cube can be it's, I'm, i keep looking down here because i've got them next to my bed <laughs> so, <laughs> so i've got that one there and i've got my, my far-sided one there that's why i keep looking down there but um but yes yeah, so someone might you know take a little bit from it 
Um, so you know, I've always got to do it with the spring of step, and um, even though I, I've, you know, I think I've done it before, someone might not see me do it before. So, do you, do you think we'll ever get to know the real Ryan Hall, or are we, are we just going to run with this one because you're not actually that bothered? Uh, I think no, yeah. This is uh, what you see is what you get. Um, <laughs> I've got Rubik's cube next to my bed. <laughs> That's pretty much all you need to know. Yeah, I, I think I am that geek, you know. <laughs> that, that nerdy guy. I, I genuinely think that you are a little bit, but I think I think you just play it because it's it's what people expect. Yeah, yeah. and the the Pythagoras thing as well. Um, yeah, I just ran with it, and then. That was my idea. <laughs> that was my my idea. And then um, a, there were a couple of times. Obviously, it's not on video, but uh, when we're doing preseason, and uh, the coach uh, Leeds was, uh, he said, "Oh, he just wanted people to get up and speak to the group, you know, just to, you know, bear all basically. Get up and some people get up and told them a life story. Some people just told them, got up and told a funny story. When I got up, I got up and proved stuff using." Uh, maths, you know, I showed them Pythagoras because I, I was laughing internally because I knew that no one else would understand it. And I was basically talking to myself, um, and I was just spending the twenty minutes, you know, that uh, speaking to the group, just like <laughs> everyone's looking, everyone's looking blank at me. It was a, I had a like an internal joke to myself there. So I mean, to wrap up the the, the perception bit, it's. It's it's down to us as individuals whether or not we're affected by how we viewed, and you you are clearly couldn't give a damn about what people think about you. Yeah, I know, no, not at all. Um, at school, it all probably all started from school, like from secondary school. Um, I was always musical, um, you know, and then you've got groups of friends, you know, who, who you, t- you tend to, you know, have most things in common. But uh, the group of friends that I hung around with, majority of the time. Um, I had no interest in music at all. So I, from from year seven onwards, I was in all the stage musicals in the band. So I went on tours around Europe with the school in the band, doing the you know we did the jazz band and the stage band, and I was part of that. And none of my friends could understand why I did it. It was just because I enjoyed it. Um, so like I said, I couldn't give a monkey's what other people think because I enjoyed doing it. Yeah, I enjoy doing it. I'm I'm wrestling a little bit with how. I mean, you've come across during this podcast kind of so laid back and how much you take everything in your stride and you don't get worked up, you don't suffer anxiety or fear even when presented with it. Yet, you, you, you know, your list of achievements is phenomenal. How, do, you know, how you become such a champion competitor and, you know, if, if I, don't, I was going to say, if you don't care, you clearly care, but you know what I mean? If you, you've, got to, you've got to hate the bad stuff and hate the losing to, to drive towards the success. I'm just wondering how, how you've, how you've managed yeah. that. Does that make sense, that question? Yeah. Um, I don't know how to answer it. Uh, when it when I was, if it coming down to, you know, the fact of playing, you know, and how I played, and don't really know why, you know, I kept on going, it was because other people around me, it was, um, I, I never wanted to let anyone down. So that's why I did, you know, that's why I played how I played and did what I did. Because I'd always look at other people, because I'm a winger. Um, I effectively do less than everyone else on the field. Then I look at the likes of, you know, Kevin Sinfield and Jimmy Peacock when, when they used to play. JP used to look like, well, you've seen pictures of him. After 80 minutes, he'd be stand, you know, exhausted. And I was thinking, like, well, I've got to do my bit as well. I've got to at least, you know, do something, in, you know, best I can. to Because he's, if he's willing to do that to his body, you know, to for this team, I've got to do something similar as well. And it were always like, I always viewed, uh, and there were various people that, you know, I always focused on. But when Kev used to get targeted and, you know, try and need in the head and stuff like that, I always thought, well, if he's willing to put his body there, you know, get up again, I've got to, you know, carry on. And for years, that's what I always thought. Because I was younger than them as well, I always thought that was easy to do. It changed a bit when they're all retired. Because there's no one there, uh, when, you know, um, in 16, when it all went peak time. Um, you know the people that I kind of looked up to like that had all all gone. Um, it, it came around in glimpses, you know, when you see Jonesy, Jonesy was still there, magazine Bob was still there. Um, but yeah, the bit, the little bit of a um, little bit, you know, went away when you know the big three retired. But um, yeah, so I had to refocus a, a bit and you know re-design uh, myself, which came good in in 2017, um, and that's what I've you know been running with ever since. 
I think the, what I was getting at in the question, I remember when I, I used to work on the, the world snooker circuit a lot because I'm, you know, I'm a snooker geek. I absolutely love it. A lot of people think, what are you on about? And I remember one of the first interviews I ever did was with Stephen Hendry. This is probably going back to 2004 when he was still playing, but he was yeah. still a champion, but he was, he was on the way and it was really, really, really getting to him because he, know, he knew how he wanted to compete, but he couldn't quite do it. And I, I'd never interviewed him before, and all the other journalists knew what he was like, and he'd just been beat by someone he should have be, should have beaten. So they knew he wasn't going to say much. And I was like, I piled in all enthusiastic, <laughs> and I tried to interview him. And the, the entire interview, including about six questions from me, lasted 40 seconds. Because uh, he was fuming. He was absolutely fuming. And I thought about that. I thought, well, that's how he's won seven world titles. because, And that was a, a little round one match in a, a small event in the Guild Hall in Preston. And he was fuming. And I, that just meant yeah. that's that drive. That's the drive of a champion. And I'm not saying you don't have that, but it's just like I can't see you being that riled up by anything. Yeah, no, I didn't really, to be honest. No, um, yeah, it was it was my determination came from somewhere else. It wasn't the you know uh, the the fear, the fear of losing. It was nothing like that. Um, I think uh, Brian McLennan might have had something to do with that because he described it really well in 2008. He said, um, it's, it's works out the same thing. And I've, I've actually stuck with this all the way through, but um, there's two ways to look at it. You can either fear losing or love winning. He said, he said, he said the power of love is stronger than the, you know, the, the drive of fear. Um, so I've always tried to think of the things that can have either a negative side or a positive side. I've always tried to go on the positive side of things, on, even down to the little bits. Um, when, you, when you do a deep yardage kick and you try to... Uh, tackle them down in there, you know, close to their try line. A lot of teams always offside, you know, because they're too eager. They got off the line too quickly, um, you know, because it's cut and they give away penalties, which just deflates all the pressure straight away. So a lot of people, you hear them sit there, you know, coaches as well, saying, don't be offside here. I says, well, that's not the right way to look at it. Do be onside. So I'd always yell from the wing, be onside, rather than don't be offside, because that puts a fear in, you know. So there's two ways to look at things. I always like to go with the positive side of things. Uh, and that's my little little battle that I have uh, in my head. We, once when I hear someone, you know, in a distant conversation, having one of the moments where they uh, they saying stuff like that, I always think to myself, why are they saying that? Why do they say it the positive way? Like if someone passes it ball and say, don't drop it, you're more likely to drop it. Say catch it, and then you'll catch it. Well, what uh, what I bet, but I bet you don't say that back to them because you're just thinking that internally and going with the flow, aren't you? No, well, from the wing, um, you can kind of. You know, Shout instructions a bit, so I do yell out. Do that. I do that. I do yell out. Be on side. <laughs> uh, you know, as best I can. So there's moments I can do it, and some, some moments I can't. But uh, a lot of it's in um, in reviews and previews on you know video sessions as well. I always when you know players speak a bit. Um, that's when I was trying to use the positive side of things. Uh, we've been talking for ages, so I'm going to wrap it up in a sec. But how does the next next year or so pan out for you? What's your have you have you well, set the end of this season? Well, don't know, shall we? Well, the uh, coronavirus things absolutely messed everything up because <laughs> um, I'm in my last. Well, I'm in my last year of a contract here. Um, I was hoping to get on the field and have a really good, impressive year playing to up, you know, to see where I'll go next year. But because it's you know the, the world's ground to a stop, uh, I've no idea what you know what, what's going to happen. So I've just got to well, the season starts on Friday. Um, I can only, you know, can only do what I can do, and uh, try and Scott, you know, create my own path from there. But does that does that so at, does that give you any the mo- the to worry? Um, yeah, but everyone's at the same boat at the moment because it's uh, it's not just me who's gone down that path. The whole sporting world stopped, uh, and there is there's quite a lot of players, you know, um, on the last year of the contract, uh, all over the world. Um, so they'll be in exactly the same boat as me. Uh, so you're just trying to, you know, play the best stand you can do with the cards you dealt. Uh, just a couple of final thoughts then. <clears throat> as, as one of the kind of the English group who've, who've gone and played, and there has been an increasing number in recent years who've, who've given it a go in the NRL with varying degrees of success. We've got superstars over there now. We've got guys who've come over and, uh, and come back. Why, why do you think some succeed and, and some don't? And is, is there an element... And I go back to, you know, if you'd have gone instead to a local club in Super League because there isn't all that upheaval. Is there an element of kind of getting the 
mental fitness and the mental equilibrium right to make that huge move across the world as well to allow yourself to play the best on the pitches. Is the part of that why some people succeed and some people don't? Um, I don't think there will ever be a formula for um, so you can categorise people and say, oh, this person will succeed over there and this person won't succeed because it's completely down to the, the timing of things. Um, like I, even the six games that I've played, I know it's not a great deal of games, but I felt every bit as a, you know, as a good player over here when I played them six games as I did do in Super League. I know people, when I played them six games, people I think thought of me as a good NRL player as well. Um, you know, well, whilst I played them, it's just because of the timing of things, I've just not been able to play more. And that it's probably, you know, when my time's up, uh, because of the injuries I've had, and, you know, the, the timing of things, it's probably going to be viewed upon as a, a bit of a failure. It's like, you know, many more, you know, before me, and I'm sure many more um, will do after, after I go as well. Um, but that's just, like I say, there's never going to be a formula about who will do well and who won't do, because it's just all down to the moment uh, like that. But it's not, you know, it's not a failure yet, and it might not be a failure. And the fact that well, you, that, that, yes, that's completely true. It's, uh, if, if, if the world ended tomorrow, it might go down as a failure because, uh, you know, because I put it down to the amount of games I've played. I know, I know the team actually won. You know, the, my team actually won the grand final when I was here, which can be viewed as a success, and I kind of contributed, you know, my little part along the way. Uh, but... You know, some people might be might be saying it's a bit of a failure, but um, like you say, there's a lot of lot of games to be played yet until uh, my time's up. Um, so hopefully, I can you know do it credit when I do get to play. So, quick final thought then to to any to any player. I was going to say young player it doesn't have to be a young player in 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 rugby league in British rugby league who might have that dream of completely changing their life by going to the other side of the world. Um, not only challenging themselves professionally, but but personally with, you know, with that move and I guess challenging homesickness and all those kind of emotions, um, that huge life changing decision that you kind of took in your stride. What what would be your advice to anyone wrestling with that with that thought in their own head? Um, well, yeah, go, go for it. Uh, I don't want to say you know everyone in you know Super League get yourself over to NRL because that's not what I'm saying. Uh, but if a particular person has got, you know, the will, you know, if they dream about playing NRL and saying, you know, if that's what we want to do, yeah, go for it. You know, what's going to hold you back? The only thing is, is yourself. You just go and do it. If if that's, you know, if, it's, if that person's teammate has got a dream of playing Super League, stay in Super League, you know, have a go at that. You know, do, do your best you can at that. Um, just make a decision, stick to it. And if that's what you feel like doing, go and do it. No, mince around because you, you, your time will go. Um, you've only got one probably opportunity. And you, career's pretty short. Just make the best, you can, best of it you can. No matter what other people think might be a good move and be a bad move, it's what you're going to want to do. You know the best. It's that, it's that tipping scale. If you want to be successful, or, you know, or it's not saying that you can't be successful. Whatever you go, but just, just go for it. It's been great chatting to you, Ryan. Uh, thank you for joining us. And the Rugby League United podcast will be back next week.